evening everybody um welcome to lockdown lecture number seven um this week's lecture is on Cezanne um and this lecture was first given um to Slay graduate painting students back in 2014 so it's quite a while ago and for that reason I have updated it a little bit as ideas have inevitably changed or interpretations of the work um so pretty much without further ado um if we do have any technical issues issues hopefully there won't be a um person at the door this week but you never knew i'm just going to get my wonderful technical assistant to sort out the images for you all okay here is the man himself paul cezanne hmm. the work of paul cezanne is often quite hard to get your head around why is he painting like that? What is he trying to achieve? What should I focus upon when looking at his art? And why is his contribution to painting so important? The answer is not a straightforward one. I personally like Suzanne because I interpret his canvas as a battleground between the experience of nature and the personal experience of existence. How can we reconcile the world with who we are? How do our personal histories infiltrate attempts to record a genuine experience through the senses? The present combines with past as our perception is contaminated with the residue of historical experience. Ask 10 people to draw a vertical line on a piece of paper from top to bottom, and each will be different, drawn by a human bundle of unique knowledge acquired from the variety of life. Artist Maurice Denis once commented, I have never heard an admirer of Cezanne give me a clear and precise reason for his admiration, a quote that is reassuringly accurate. Initially, one can struggle to engage with the work of Cezanne. At a glance, his paintings can appear uneventful, uninviting, and a little remote, nothing stirs. Cezanne's interpretation of his subjects can prevent an entrance into understanding, perhaps because it's such a personal interpretation what is it that we are trying to apprehend and appreciate? There's often a lack of specific narrative and symbolic values are not attached to depicted objects to assemble meaning. We are left with paint and personal perception. Suzanne's paintings feel like explorations, valid only to the artist when in production. Once their process has been exhausted, they're cast aside, useless in their finished state. Cezanne uses his paintings to develop his knowledge. One wonders if he ever felt he achieved his goal to create a harmony between the nature that is out there and the nature that is in here. Each canvas reads as another attempt and development towards his ambition, a byproduct in the search for a solution. I do not think Cezanne ever found a remedy to the pictorial challenges he strived to overcome. But does any great artist finally make a work and go, great, that's it. That's all I ever wanted to say. And if this were to happen, what next? Surely it's the feeling of dissatisfaction and the desire to have another go that keeps you creating. Cezanne's paintings show us the artist and not the audience. He was in it for himself. He did not have to fulfill a devotional or commercial brief. He was solely committed to realizing his intention upon canvas unburdened with thoughts of acceptance from an audience or art establishment. Suzanne had financial security through inheritance, a luxury that paid time. Time spent pursuing pure thought, focused on nature and expressed through paint. Suzanne left so much behind for artists to develop. He uses a pictorial language most painters did not even consider to exist let alone recognize. All of a sudden, the most genuine expression of existence looked nothing like the reality to which one had become accustomed. Abstraction began to show a more direct assimilation of perception, a personal response to the world, which released the artist from pictorial precedents that had lasted for millennia. Cezanne came to be known as the father of modern art a legacy one imagines will be eternally enduring. The paintings he produced showed another way, 
and this lecture will attempt to chart Cezanne's route towards abstraction. However, Cezanne himself declared, chatter about art is almost useless. So I hope some worth will be uncovered by the words that follow. In 1861, at the age of 22, Cezanne moved from Maison Provence in the southeast of France to Paris to join his childhood friend, the writer Emile Zola. Cezanne's father, seen here in a portrait from around 1865, was keen for his son to pursue a career in business. And with pragmatic persuasion, he wrote to his son, think of the future. With genius, you die. With money, you eat. But by 1864, his father gave in and accepted Cezanne's decision to pursue painting. Cezanne sat and failed his entrance examinations for the École de Beaux-Arts. Time in Paris had affected his drawings, which no longer studied the academic example championed by artistic in institutions. Unlike this earlier study of Cezanne's from 1862, he was moving into a highly romantic kind of painting seen in works such as The Abduction from 1867, The Spirit of Delacroix and Dormier, was clearly in evidence through Cezanne's use of expressive brush marks, coupled with a more graphic, solid form seen here in Dormier's, uh, Dormier's Don Quixote, painted in 1855. Cezanne was still depicting traditional subject matters, such as Christ en l'homme from 1867, but his descriptions of them were impulsive and otherworldly. His marks were contemporary, capturing the movement and moment of brush to canvas as ideas are formed through process rather than premeditated design. Forms begin to have solid quality. The intense red of Christ's robe is almost painted into a shape independent of Christ's form. Cezanne is beginning to give color more autonomy. The blue dress of La Madeleine from 1869 does not serve to accurately or convincingly describe the anatomy of the figure underneath. It is employed to mirror the curve of the sleeve and skull in an attempt to unify the composition through shape. Artists have always made connections of form across their canvases, but Cezanne is beginning to make it the primary subject. Cezanne's paintings of the 1860s were strange and clunky there was a heaviness to his painting and an excessive use of black. The stove in the studio, a small painting of 41 by 30 centimeters, was painted around 1865. We see, um, and it strikes one as a rather odd image. Here we are confronted by the back of the canvas, unconvincingly propped up against a wood burner. The rough handling of paint describes its framework in bright contrast against the gloom of the studio, which resembles a sort of coal shed. One wonders why the artist chose to paint the subject. It seems to somehow usher the audience away. Oil sketches can be seen on the black back wall. The light shape of the turned canvas is a bold form, unsteady in space within the darkness. Cezanne try, tried and failed to enter a work into the Salon of 1866. The annual state exhibition could launch an artist's career and painters such as Gustave Courbet exploited the public stage it could provide by gaining profile through grandiose controversy. Please see previous lecture. Cezanne was much more low key. He did not pursue a public platform with such vigor, although he did exhibit in what could be described as the first impressionist show in 1874, alongside the following works by Sicily, Renoir, Pissarro, Degas, Morisot, and Monet, who showed this work, Impression, Rising Sun, the work which gave its name to the whole movement, cemented by critics who negatively described the works as just impressions, the Impressionists produced some of the most celebrated and instantly recognizable works within the history of painting. Famed for their stunning use of color and ambition to capture the changing effects of light within nature. The Impressionists paved the way for artists to create a more personal interpretation of what they saw. 
In order to rapidly capture the world before their eyes, artists worked outside in the landscape, introducing, introduce, ugh, introducing techniques that transformed the previously smooth surface of the canvas into a myriad of colored marks. Cezanne chose to exhibit a modern Olympia after Manet's famous work and a painting quite opposite in inspiration, The House of a Hanged Man, painted in 1873. The public and critics alike received the exhibition with scorn and disgust, reserving the most explicit criticism for Cezanne. Of Cezanne's paintings, one critic wrote, they provoke laughter, yet they're pitiable. They reveal the most profound ignorance of drawing, of composition, of coloring. But we know Cezanne was satisfied with this work because it was regularly exhibited during his lifetime at the artist's express request. Yet Cezanne took part in only one of the eight exhibitions of an impressionist painting that, that occurred between 1876 and 1886. Luckily for Cezanne, he was unburdened with the, necess with the necessity to show and sell his works. So he retreated back to the isolation of Aison Provence to focus slowly, solely on his painting. Here he began to develop a way of recording his perception that was very different from the Impressionists. Using what was at his disposal, he began to form a visual language that was yet to be spoken in Western art. The House of the Hanged Man is an odd painting. Ignore the title. It is likely the name of the man who owned the house sounded like the French word for hanged man, pendu. Narrative is sparse, but the space in the painting is odd and intriguing. We are looking at a landscape showing near and far, and yet there is a lack of depth. Space is squeezed between form, which evolves away from the objects they represent into solid shape. The thatched roof of the building on the right is so heavy. The paint bypasses a description of a roof and describes something else. Pure form? I'm not sure. The patch of light ground below the bl blue door in the lower center of the painting starts to sit between and in front of the grass verge and side of the house. Resembling more than the gravelly drive, it transitions between space and form, simultaneously both. Touches of green unify the whole. Loaded in the triangular shapes at the bottom, green is scattered between the branches of the trees on the left, across the roofs of the houses, and into a band that sits below the sky and distant hills. There is a heaviness to the work. Solid forms fill the canvas. A way of beginning to understand Suzanne's vocabulary is discuss how it differs from his contemporaries. Taking the advice of his friend Pissarro, Suzanne had abandoned the rough, dark manner of his earlier works. The heavy use of black had made way for a brighter palette. Suzanne's touch was lighter than before, but retained a presence of gravity absent in the Impressionist's fleeting mark. Writer Venturi cited a remark made by a peasant who had watched Suzanne and Pissarro and claimed that when working, Pissarro pricked while Suzanne laid in. If this quote is to, to be taken as accurate, it demonstrates the difference towards their approach, a constructed, determined brushstroke versus light touches that combine to create a more ephemeral interpretation. The House of the Hanged Man demonstrates Suzanne's ability to transform a picturesque cottage into a painting that has nothing to do with the depicted subject matter. We are not really looking at a cottage. We are looking at the solidification of light and atmosphere into form and structure, abstract painting. We do not dwell on an atmosphere or a feeling provoked from what we already know about the conditions of light we see or the warmth we might receive as the sun moves from behind a cloud. Suzanne does generate a golden glow we can recall from nature, but it is fixed, permanent, not temporal. If we look at Pissarro's uh, painting, the artist has captured the atmosphere of the scene. One can imagine the movement of the trees, the passing of the clouds pushed along by a cool wind and the clatter of the carriage upon the road. There is a believable sense of perspective as the carriage moves towards the viewer. Marks are hurriedly applied by Pissarro to capture the essence of the scene before it has changed out of recognition and the moment is lost. 
Impressionist paintings gave their audience a chance to feel the sun on their face, to experience the startling effect of light transfigured by color across a myriad of natural surfaces. This is The Gust of Wind by Renoir, a great painting from 1872 in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And it magnificently captures the weather as the landscape dances before your eyes. We look up to hear the rush of wind through the trees. We see the clouds tumbling through the sky and feel the heat of the sun carried on the warm breeze. Artists recognized and understood from the experience of being in the landscape that color was permanently on the move as light continuously changed. Claude Monet's Autumn Effect at Argentile, painted in 1873, demonstrates the artist's ambition to capture the effects of the season, the changing color of the trees and the movement of the clouds above the gentle ripples in the water. One could imagine stepping into such an image because an atmosphere is conjured and relayed by rapid marks, which race to record the effect witnessed by the eye before the light alters and the moment has gone. Monet described how the landscape does not exist in its own right, since its appearance endlessly fluctuates. He described how he should like to paint as a bird sings. This statement of impulsive spontaneity could not be farther from Cezanne's truth. And like much Impressionist painting, there is little weather in Cezanne's work. Weather would indicate we are looking at something temporary and on the move. Cezanne strove to create something firm and lasting. Immaterial visions are transformed into forms so stable they have material force. Cezanne's The Lake at Annecy, painted in 1896, shares the subject matter of a landscape viewed across water. However, Cezanne's interpretation is very different. The reflections in the water appear almost carved into the surface of the lake. The water does not come out towards us, as in Monet's work. It drops with the surface of the canvas, encouraged by the dark verticals that repeat across the painting. Light areas at the top of the canvas are confused between mountain tops, the sky between and the branches of the tree. Color clogs the space between forms. Background and foreground are confused into one. Whereas Monet's color dissolves form, to quote Cezanne's famous statement, color equals form, a point to which I will later return. On visiting a show of Impressionist painting and not in reference to Cezanne's work, Pablo Picasso was said to have exclaimed, here we can see it is raining, here we can see the sun is shining, but nowhere can we see painting. Cezanne is all about painting and he uses it to interrogate his perception, pursuing a deeper comprehension of reality than the Impressionists. The objects in his painting are not covered by reflections and smothered in atmosphere, and nor do they combine to create an open window in a beautiful sunny scene. In 1894, in reference to Cezanne, Gustave Geoffrey wrote, one no longer notices the arbitrary distributions of light and shade, formerly so surprising. One is in the presence of an integrated painting that seems a single whole and was executed slowly. Cezanne is analyzing, not merely recording what he sees. His painting is the record of the analysis of his own vision. He is, he is using painting as research to, in his words, endeavor to produce pictures that are an education. He asks, is this what I see? Rather than, this is what I see. The presence of the artist's analysis of their own vision ensures quality within paint. If an artist's interpretation reveals only resemblance, what is the artist or viewer to learn? If we look at Cezanne's Avenue at Chantilly from 1888, we can deduce that this is a painting of a shaded path, but the distribution of light and color obstructs our understanding of the space within the image. Ambiguous touches of red and blue focus our eye in the center of the painting. The canopies of trees bend into solid form the darkness that frames the center appears not as shadow, but as color. The dark ring gives solid form to the corridor of trees and the dark marks highlight the keyhole shape of the view through the trees, which protrudes out towards us instead of recessing back into the picture plane. This central view also moves forward through its connection in color, form 
and location to the green vertical shape at the bottom of the composition. This shape pins the bottom of the painting to the canvas surface, preventing it from traveling out towards us. The green mark aligns the area of the painting closest to us with the area of the painting furthest from us, the path from where we stand and the end of the tunnel down which we look are not in front and behind, they share the same plane. La Pain Lestique from 1875 to 76 employs a similar distortion of ground from the center. When stood in front of this painting in the L'Orangerie in Paris, the middle is mesmerizing. It seems to converge to create real form. It protrudes and retracts, having freed itself from the occupation of having to present something exterior to itself. As the outer areas of the painting are still confined to describing the surrounding landscape, the center of the work takes on a life of its own. It pulses and twitches on a new path towards representation. Still life with plaster cast from 1895 to fix a statue sculpted in paint as it would have been sculpted in stone. To draw it reveals a satisfying collection of curves that encase the form. Large in scale, the cupid stands within an interior that seems to have been tilted back and forth, forward and back, as objects still attempt to find their position. The plaster cast sits on a surface that describes a definite edge to the right and on the left continues out of line and into blue fabric, which moves into a form that supports two apples. Behind the cupid, canvases are stacked and propped in a manner that almost supports and frames the back of the cupid. The right side of the painting rises up towards the canvas plane. A fruit seems to balance, suspended in space, while simultaneously resting on a surface. It is difficult to unpick these distortions because Suzanne works hard to ensure they cease to be visible in themselves when the painting is observed as a whole. Suzanne described these, distor these distortions as the result of his enforced logic upon impressionist optics. Objects are observed from not one, but several points of view, leading to the beginnings of a new kind of perspective, which Cubism later developed. Cezanne did not see linear design in nature, and so did not include it in his paintings. Instead, he suggests, treat nature in terms of the cone, the cylinder, and the sphere, yet, Few great artists' theories are in need of more explanation. However, if we consider that the crucial manner of all these shapes are their round sections, it suggests that Cezanne starts with the point nearest to him and works back. That is to say, the compositions appear more convex than concave. To understand this further, I look to my own vision. How do I see things? Certainly not through a frame, but neither by the cone, the cylinder and the sphere. But that made sense to Suzanne, and I hugely admire his commitment to replicate the experience in paint. It enabled others to later express what they felt or saw in any way they wanted. Suzanne, like many great painters of the past, found it necessary to use distortions in order to fulfill his intentions. However, he was unusual in the way he did so, more consciously and thoroughly than most. Artists have always organized color and form across the canvas to suit the constructed reality of the painting and to create a unified whole within the limits of the frame. Jan van Eyck arranges color for, and form into a supremely conscious design in his Arnolfini portrait from 1434. He uses a series of verticals from left to right the window frame, fur lined trim and pleats of the man's robe, prayer beads on the wall, floorboards, carpet edge, pleats and fur trim of the woman's dress and bed hanging. A central line of activity from top to bottom starts from the chandelier, signature, mirror, joined hands, cushion, shoes and dog. The hands of the figures are light forms that connect to the faces and the joint hands create a vital horizontal that supports the entire energy of the painting. And yet this orchestration of form does not override the narrative. Our main focus is still the couple, the reflection in the mirror and the objects within the room. 
However, Cezanne's placement of color and form is the subject of his paintings. We are not looking at a narrative or an encyclopedia of symbolic objects. We are looking at painting. One could also apply this statement to the Arnolfini portrait. If you solely appreciate how the artist has organized all we see within the frame. The clear lack of narrative previously supplied by artists can make the spaces created by Suzanne difficult for the beholder to access. They deny an imaginative entry. One is confronted by a new kind of painting that is, as Denny observed, perpetually between invention and imitation. The differing perspectives and confused relationships of object and space may at first be readily, may not be readily accessible, but because Suzanne achieves a unity across the canvas, works must be approached as complete expressions without hierarchy of mark or form. The grounds of the Chateau Noir from 1900 demonstrate how Suzanne's parallel strokes of paint unite the canvas to give the clearest indication that the work of art is categorically different from the experience of nature. Suzanne's constructed brushwork is original in its physical materiality, which suggests the artist's immediate personal experience of nature. It signals interpretation over imitation. Suzanne's directional strokes sit beside one another in units of space, color, form, and shadow. The consistently bold tones are added, joined, linked, and superimposed one over the other without ever blending, constructing a block of harmonies. Cezanne never gives marks of value in their, own, in their own right, which would disrupt his intention to create a harmony parallel to nature. The harmony Cezanne sought to create in painting was independent of the natural world, not a replica, but a harmony of equal quality. I quote, to paint is not to copy the object slavishly. It is to grasp a harmony among many relationships. The parallel stroke deployed by Cezanne if it is assertively anti-illusionistic. Its unique method of recording and realizing the artist's sensation unifies the canvas through repetitive shape. Suzanne plots out painting using personal logic. Shapes lock into one another. He connects the foreground to the background. Objects protrude and regress in line with the physics of the painting rather than the physical space, seen here in Farm in Normandy from 1882. The light blue sky glimped through the trees has the quality of objects and to draw from his painting feels like an achievement because he's done the hard work for you. The subject has been analyzed and reconstructed into a logical order that is easy to organize upon the picture plane. As Suzanne states, drawing is nothing but the configuration of what you see, but it's how he is reconfiguring, reconfigured his vision which is so impressive. We have the unmuter. <laughs> Thank you, technical assistant. Space becomes a form between two objects, seen here in mountains in Provence. Light becomes solid, not fleeting. The color is the shape, weight and purpose of the form. It takes on a quality of its own, possessing an autonomy and presence independent of its representation of a red roof, an approach that applies Cezanne's famous equation, color equals form. Cezanne entrusts color with greater pictorial authority than ever before. A stroke of color can be a myriad of things. Knock, knock, who's there? Abstraction. When discussing Francis Bacon and Cezanne, artist Richard Hamilton wrote, Bacon has always painted a form. When he made a mark with a brush, it was always a form, never a void. It was never nothing, it was always something. A mark meant something, it was not just space. When Cezanne painted, any mark meant form or it meant space and the two things were completely interchangeable. Every brushstroke was either the space which defined the form or the form on the other side. The brushstroke can move on either side of this form. Suzanne's marks, whether describing void or form, sorry, Suzanne's marks, whether describing 
void or volume were transposable. Cezanne developed an ability to uncover the whole structure of a landscape with just a few touches of colour. This is his Le Mans Saint Victoire from 1905, a watercolour on paper owned by the Tate. Renoir exclaimed, how on earth does he do it? He cannot put two touches of colour onto a canvas without it being an achievement. Expertly placed brushstrokes employ the white patches of paper as form, as vital as the mark of his brush. All forms exist in relation to neighbouring forms, even if this is the white space of the paper, or canvas, as seen in this version of Le Mans Saint Victoire from around 1885. Cezanne described how the principal issue in painting is to find the right distance colour needs to express all the breaks in space. It is there that one recognises a painter's talent. Space within painting has always been as important as form. The space between the separated arms of the artist, seen in Artemisia Gentileschi's Allegory of Painting from the 1630s. The space between hand and head, seen in Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks from the 1490s. The blank space that supports weight, seen in Diego Velasquez's portrait of Pablo de Valladoid from 1635. It is light that describes shape, a phenomenon also crystallized by Cezanne in his ability to capture remarkably accurate shades within nature. If one squints their eyes when observing this painting, the Atang de Soeur from 1875. The light is astonishingly real in terms of its distribution and placement, more so than many of the Impressionist works so celebrated for their light, but so often displaying an overall glow, seen in Monet's Rouen Cathedral from 1892. Cezanne's colour is the very life of the objects contained within his canvas, seen here in another painting of Le Mans Saint Victoire from 1887. Colour does not cloak form to indicate specific object or condition of light. It is in complete unison with drawing. Cezanne explains how drawing and colour are not distinct. When one paints, one also draws. The more the colours harmonise, the more precise the drawing. When colour is at its richest, form is at its fullest. Contrasts and tonal relations, these are the secrets of drawing and modelling. For Cezanne, a successful painting was one in which form and space were conveyed by modulations and contrasts of colour alone. Cezanne explained the difficulty he had in, su in suggesting spatial depth by colour and was aware of his failings, where sometimes the colour remained colour without becoming the expression of distance. Cezanne described colour as the place where our brain and the universe meet. This is his forest from 1894. He did not aim to convey this through a generic landscape painting, but a painting in which to quote, the perfume of the pines, which is sharp in the sun, must be wedded to the green scent of the meadows, the odour of the stones, the perfume of the distant marble of the Monson Victoire. This, he continues, is what must be rendered and only with colours, without literature. With colour, without literature, what a release to experience painting without words. But I shall continue. Cezanne's intention was to astonish Paris with an apple. And Cezanne's still lifes illustrate the scale of his ambition. They are a rejection of the hierarchy and the value systems for which that hierarchy stood, privileging significant human action over the study of inanimate objects. The apple of subject is almost irrelevant the artist is painting their vision. Pom and Bisquets from 1879 shows us a beautiful turquoise background repleted in the plate and in small patches across the surface of the chest. The apples are solid and present, a stunning arrangement of warm reds, oranges, and a more acrid yellow. The front of the chest they sit upon disintegrates into brush marks and blank space. The catch juts out awkwardly from the colored units of brush marks. The shadow wants it to appear lifted, but its color flattens form. The perspective is again in motion. The three horizontal bands of the painting each have a different relationship to the picture plane, like a piece of concertinaed paper. Painter Paul Ceruzier wrote, 
One says about an apple which is painted by an insensitive artist, I could eat it. Of an apple by Cezanne, one says it is beautiful. No one would dare peel it. It is more likely that one would feel like copying it. Cezanne was a real painter's painter. The public may have been frustrated by canvases that denied them entry into an imaginative world, but artists were quick to see that Cezanne was onto something. Maurice Denis' work, Homage to Cezanne, painted in 1900, is a record of the admiration artists felt for the solitary painter. In a letter to Cezanne, in reference to the painting, which illustrates Comte Glass and Apples from 1880, Denis wrote, because it is to you they are indebted for whatever they had understood about painting, and we will never be able to thank you enough for it. Paintings by Gauguin and Renoir hang in the background, but it is Cezanne, now an aging, reclusive, and increasingly unwell man that becomes the prime focus of attention in the artistic world. Odilon Redon is given pride of place. He is shown in the foreground on the far left, and most of the figures are looking at him. He is listening to Paul Serousier, who is standing in front of him. From left to right, we can recognize Edward Vuillard, the critic André Melrio in a top hat, Vollard behind the easel, Maurice Denis, Paul Ranson, Kerr Xavier Roussel, Pierre Bonnard smoking a pipe, and lastly, Marthe Denis, the painter's young wife. Cezanne rarely showed in public, but was collected by many artists of the day who viewed his works in each other's private collections. Gauguin owned Comptier Glass and Apples, and Monet, Degas, Pissarro, Matisse, Renoir, Calbot, and Denis also owned paintings by Cezanne. Artists believed there was something deeply important to be learned from Cezanne's work. They could see he was becoming fluent in a visual language other artists had only just discovered. Cezanne let nothing compromise his goal to understand through logical development what we see and feel through the study of nature. Artists were quick to respect the crucial task Cezanne had set himself and the straightforward dedication he gave to a conceptual ideal that was to be continued well into the 20th century. Cezanne had proved capable of convincingly instilling life into objects received from his own personal perception to imbue them with a reality relevant to the painting itself, rather than the reality of the object that existed as the model for the painting. This is Cezanne's still life with apples, painted around 1877. Writing in 1922, Clive Bell explained, a work of art is like a rose. A rose is not beautiful because it is like something else. Neither is a work of art. The quality inherent in Cezanne's work is not understood from our own personal experience of his subject. As Serousier said, we do not look at his still life and exclaim, wow, the apple looks good enough to eat. I like it. We are keen to understand the apple as a work of art. As the writer D.H. Lawrence explains, Cezanne's apples are a real attempt to let the apple exist in its own separate entity without transfusing it with personal emotion. Cezanne's great effort was, as it were, to shove the apple away from him and let it live of itself. If we compare Cezanne's apples with Corbet's still life with apples and a pomegranate from 1871, Corbet's apples glow with ripeness. You can feel the weight of the apple in your hand as you make your selection, based on your assessment of their bruised and scuffed surfaces. You can imagine the juice below their shining skins, which would run from the corners of your mouth after the crunch of a bite. Color, light and shape are used to elaborate upon what we already know about apples and to elevate their status by capturing their beauty and appeal. The subjects for Cezanne's paintings are not selected for their beauty or wisdom. For Cezanne, it is enough for them to be painted because they are seen. It is the act of configuring his perception that keeps Cezanne painting and not the desire to record the drama or emotion embedded within a subject. Even the portraits of his wife, uh, Madame Cezanne painted around 1890, lack the warmth of emotion or sentiment. As D.H. Lawrence again observes, Cezanne makes Madame Cezanne 
most still, most happily. The portraits are strange and sometimes mask-like. They too have been reconstructed from perception into sculpted lines and shapes of colour which meet and meld together. It is as though the human form has been recorded by one who is unfamiliar with the emotional attributes each of us possess. It is only the form of the subject Suzanne concerns himself with. He denies us the emotional personality of the subject that often helps us to relate to things as human beings. Suzanne is so intent on confining us wholly to the experience of the eye that in some ways he cuts us off from the world the eye beholds. Similar to his landscapes, the attributes which make nature ready for spiritual or emotional communion are diluted. Atmosphere, narrative, intimacy and drama remain absent and so cannot weave a web that supports a sentimental residence. Cezanne correlates emotion within the construction of the subject, as he puts it, if I interpret too much one day, if I think while I'm painting, if I meddle, then whoosh, everything goes away. The hand is directed by nature and it acquires knowledge each time it paints. It is not directed by feeling, but nor is it a slave to the formal structure of composition it creates. All forms are found in nature and are not conceived through geometry. Nothing is elevated above or at the expense of Cezanne's direct sensations. It's here we should mention Cezanne's contemporary, another great innovator, Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh also worked from his direct experience of nature. Although his vision of the world refused to remain still within a perceived order, it twisted and pulsed with a restless energy seen here in a wheat field with cypresses from 1889. The landscape was personified by Van Gogh. He uncovers the drama Cezanne was so careful to conceal. His works are laden with expression, which shudders through his subject. Intensified colors vibrate through Van Gogh's agitated brush, which describes forms that twist and curl in the agony and ecstasy of the landscape. Van Gogh, an artist such as Millet, seen here in his Gust of Wind from 1873, personify the landscape which is alive and in motion, whereas Cezanne pauses and preserves. However, that is not to say spiritual expression, mood and atmosphere are absent from Cezanne's work. If we remember his earlier quote and desire to paint the perfume of the pine, scent of the meadows and odor of the stones, it is clear that Cezanne is interested in conveying the spirit of his subject, yet the necessary sentiment required is concealed by Cezanne's fascination with form and pictorial truth. He evokes a feeling of ordered sensation rather than animated sentiment. Light, color and form are uncorrupted by emotions that can intoxicate the transcendence of truth. Brushstrokes are utilitarian. They do not break formation. No single mark is pro promoted above the rest to become a thing in itself. Each touch of paint is coordinated and harmonized with those already present. All strokes contribute to the overall idea of the painting. And all this must be done whilst recording nature as it is seen and nature as it is felt. Cezanne's canvas was his laboratory, where he repeatedly honed and tested his method by painting the same subject over and over again. The finished painting is not the lesson, it is the process. In his later years, Cezanne worked on a series of paintings known as the Bathers. Three large versions were found in his studio following his death. Classical and subject matter, they are an anomaly within his oeuvre. But we should attempt to make sense of Cezanne's ambition to make of Impressionism something solid and lasting, like the art in the museums, and to also redo Poussin after nature. Poussin was the father of the French academic tradition, the tradition of hierarchy and privilege that various modernist artists questioned and subverted. This is Poussin's The Triumph of Pan from 1636 and portrays an astounding harmony achieved through constructed composition. Diagonal shapes rec repeat across the image as outstretched limbs link into one another. A solid horizontal band is formed in the middle of the painting. 
Color is equally distributed across fabrics that fill in any gaps left by the figures. A wide triangular shape holds the composition together, its framework built by the long trumpet on the left and the outstretched arms of the woman on the right. Poussin attains a harmony through figurative composition, an achievement Cezanne wished to replicate in reference to nature. However, Cezanne's Bathers in the National Gallery's collection is a work I personally struggle with. On the face of it, these are female figures situated in the landscape, but there is no narrative to grasp hold of. Are they imagined? Are they seen? Is this a painting that sits in the corridor between classicism and abstraction? Cezanne seems to look beyond the figures as people and instead considers them in purely formal terms. Like his landscapes, they too are beginning to be transcribed into colored units. Is it here he attempts to redo Poussin after nature and to make something solid and lasting like the art in the museums? But perhaps it was an ambition too far. If we look at the largest version at 210 and 250 centimeters, which resides in Philadelphia, the figures dissolve into the landscape. The hair of the stood figure on the far left melts into the tree and sky a figure below her buttocks disintegrates further into the landscape. The face of the woman who crouches on the left has completely disappeared. The figure in the far right has two left arms, or are they marks of another figure's legs? Two figures on the shoreline mimic the vertical rises of the landscape, their faces obliterated by blankness. Little emotion is conveyed partly down to the obscuring of facial features, but the bodies are stilted, wooden, and without a tangible energy. Shape unites the composition, which is structured around a large triangle and repeated rouged cheeks, which appears elsewhere in the painting, further connecting the figures. The building of a fire or perhaps some ritual task is taking place in the foreground, but our attention is not particularly drawn to this action. I do like these paintings, but the intrusion of human form brings with it the search for narrative, clouding Suzanne's intriguing intention to capture the figure as he does the landscape. When figures appear within painting, it is often, who are they? What are they doing? Why are they here? Part of the pleasure when experiencing Suzanne's work is that we are not preoccupied with these types of questions. Instead, one can marvel at his expression of color, form and space within the frame. This alone is an entirely satisfying subject matter. Cezanne died in 1906, when he was still working on these large paintings, so it is unlikely they were resolved. Although the figure described as pure form and colour was achieved later by, Hon by Henri Matisse in 1852 through his series of blue nudes. This is blue nude too. We marvel at the shape, the negative and positive space, the relationship to the frame, the gravity of the signature and date, the personality of the cut line. It is perfect. We are not lifted away by the why, the where, the what. We are entirely present in the existence of color, form and space. Cezanne's lifespan may have restricted his achievement of this goal, but without his attempts, I wonder if we would have works such as these. Great artists move things along. They provide ideas which require further development, taken up by those who come after. Great paintings provide new means of visual communication, building upon ideas painted five or 500 years earlier. Piero della Francesca treated his figures as pure form in the mid 15th century. Emotion is restricted. Figures are arranged into patterns of shape. The interlocking of form and a harmony of space and color is essential. Art history is not a progression. It is a series of interpretations that link across the centuries. All artists are attempting to reveal a truth within what, all artists are attempting to reveal a truth within what they paint. And Cezanne's journey towards abstraction was his effort to reconcile the exterior world with the interior mind. The turn of the century saw many great artists create their own unique methods of interpreting the world. 
This is Pablo Picasso's Brick Factory at Tortosa from 1909. And quickly, this led to full-blown abstraction. This is Kupka's Vertical Diagonal Plane from 1913 to 14. Cezanne visually analyzed what he saw with a dedication that must have made his eyes bleed. One feels he looked with such intensity. And this is the thing to remember about abstract painting. If it is done well, it is all about looking. Looking at the world, looking at the evolving painting before you, and looking at oneself. Abstraction comes from the intense observation of the world, and to do it well is incredibly difficult. I heard someone say on TV last week that there is no such thing as a bad abstract painting. Well, if that is true, there is no such thing as a bad painting. All painting is abstract. It is an interpretation of what we see, think and feel, repackaged for the frame, an abstracting device that creates a space for form and concept. Cezanne did not attempt a replica of the natural world. He understood this to be futile and impossible since nature is nature and painting is painting. He instead produced work that was categorically different from the experience of nature. He was completely committed to processing the information he received from his senses through the mechanics of the mind. Cezanne's portrayal in paint is completely genuine. And in that respect, it is the most accurate record of reality one could hope to paint. Thank you. <laughs> the end. <laughs>